Konnichiwa party people! Watashi no namewa fenanan desu. Korewa watashi no live show shode, where we take a creative look behind the scenes of live TV. I'm going to do the rest of the show in English, I think I've done that terribly enough. It's one of the world's largest outside broadcasting operations, lasting just over two weeks and capturing every start, finish and victory moment for over 11,000 athletes, over 330 events. Well, chuck in another 500 or so for the Paralympics too. One of these events is this epic matchup. In the blue corner, the global pandemic, postponing the games for a year and the announcement of absolutely no spectators in the grounds themselves. And the red corner, lofty plans to make this the most immersive games ever, with a 30% increase of broadcasting from Rio 2016 to 9,500 hours. Plus 360 degree athlete tracking, smart cameras and mics, all the immersive technology, and broadcasting this in Ultra HD HDR with some badass 8K. All of this while keeping everyone on the ground as COVID safe as possible. It's only Tokyo 2020, the games are the 32nd Olympiad. So join me as we put down our knitting yarn and take a dive, quite literally, into this monumental operation of broadcasting as we find out exactly how every pixel, voxel and waveform was delivered all the way from Tokyo to wherever you were. Soshite ma Jujitsu Suji with various forms of media, from the written, to radio, to newsreels, from the very first modern games in 1896. It wasn't until Berlin 1936 that were the first to be televised, to various viewing halls to 160,000 people. 1948 took this a step further, being the first to broadcast live to viewers in the London area, to an estimated half a million people. And 1964 was the first to be broadcast internationally, via satellite and in colour, to the US, Canada and Europe. Years since pushed the boundaries of broadcast technology and visual storytelling, from slow motion introduced in the 1960s, to more compact colour equipment through the 1970s. HD tests were well underway by Barcelona 1992, and of course were officially natively broadcast in 2008, and 2012 being the first to have digital content surpass television content. They also trialled 3D filming in this year as well. All of this is coordinated and produced by OBS, the Olympic Broadcasting Services, a company from the IOC set up in 2001 and first deployed in its current form in Beijing 2008. The 160 strong setup balloons to over 8,000 crew members during the games as they're responsible for producing and providing unbiased coverage of the event to rights holding broadcasters. This year, the IBC is over at Tokyo Big Site, Japan's biggest convention center with over 115,000 square meters of space. This year is also the first to broadcast natively in 4K ultra high definition and HDR for better colour and detail, with some events also covered in 8K, shown at a special sound theatre, and the convergence of new technology from 5G, IP, cloud and AI is also helping with the demand, yet keeping the footprint and operations as minimised as possible. Broadcasting the games has been a real feat of technological broadcast engineering since first televising it in 1936 and quite aptly coming almost full circle to broadcasting live in colour in Tokyo 1964. In fact the 1964 games were pretty innovative if you ask me, especially from the use of its groundbreaking pictograms used to help convey the games beyond the barriers of language. In fact it's a fantastic video which you absolutely need to check out. From mate and fellow designer Linus Bowman, check out the link over here. Absolutely incredible video looking at the history and significance of the pictograms and why this year was pretty special. And I have a cheeky cameo, but bar that, the video is incredible. Go watch. Now what's really cool about the OBS this year is its dedication to maintain a smaller footprint while delivering a high standard of the games. To do this, they use prefabricated panels and installation that's easy to assemble and reuse again for future games. Their setup, however, takes years of planning to turn an empty shell into a technological hub fit for broadcasting the games with hundreds of kilometers of cabling and tons of equipment to use. This year, they take residence at Tokyo Big Site, Japan's biggest exhibition center. Both the IBC, the International Broadcast Center, and the MPC, the main press center, are housed here, taking the East and West tools respectively, hosting no less than 17 rights holding broadcasters, namely NBC, the BBC, Discovery Eurosport, just to name a few. NBC alone, one of the biggest rights holding broadcasters who've paid a whopping $7.75 billion to broadcast the games until 2032, takes a space almost equivalent to one of these massive, massive halls. They mean business. In this always on, on-demand era we're now in, this year's game spoils us just a little bit more. 
by presenting the most realistic experience one can get without travelling to the games in person. Given the strict regulations in place due to the pandemic, and even more so for those down on the ground in Tokyo, all of this was done with incredible cutting edge broadcast techniques and technology to help blow your socks off wherever you were. On top of the ample TV coverage, these are the third game since 2012 with an increased digital presence, with more people than ever before watching the games on their phones and tablets. So you're at home, or you're on the bus, or in your local gym on your spin bike trying to outcycle these Olympians. <laughs> nice try. But what things did OBS do to help bring you deeper into the games than ever before? Well, this year's games were the first to be covered in native ultra high definition and HDR, meaning increased resolution and detail watching the games. The ceremonies and the selection of events were also covered in mind boggling 8K, that's super high vision, courtesy of NHK, Japan's public broadcaster. This was shown in the IBC to really wow viewers. Just as HD tests were being undertaken in Barcelona in 1992 and became official by Beijing 2008, 4K is the standard this year, with much more resolution to come in future games. All of this from over a thousand cameras dotted all over Tokyo's venues, with some notably cool ones. We go underwater with a camera fitted to the length of the pool, offering impressive views of swimmer's techniques. These were fitted by specialist divers and offers an incredible view under the waves. Robotic and remote cameras are also thrown into the mix. In the volleyball poles, dug into the ground at target ranges, on your bikes, and even on sailing boats so you can really feel the spray in your face. And from depth to height, it's not just the athletes here with record breaking figures. As the games features the longest cable camera installation in the world, used for the rowing at over 2,180 meters long, strung between two towers. And for events such as skateboarding and BMX, are four point cable cameras, commonly known as spider cameras, offering unrivaled views across the course, of which there's 10 fitted out of 11 venues. In fact, anywhere they can put a camera, they did. On base plates, on target boards, even on referees. What's also really good is production teams have been selected based on their skills on covering the games themselves. So for example, they've got NBC crews to cover golf, Sky New Zealand for the Rugby Sevens, and NHK for Judo and Karate. Including motion pictures, still pictures are also being taken care of, not by OBS, but by Getty Images. Robot cameras make an appearance where, controlled remotely, they can capture images and have them on their website ready to go within 30 seconds. Okay, so pictures are good. How about some sound? Sounds like that are absolutely hilarious, but when watching high level sports is absolutely essential. With microphones dotted everywhere, on the gymnastics runway, on the field, and even on the boys for rowing. A whopping 3,600 microphones were used this year with 28 different models with 5.1.4 configuration for the ultimate surround sound. Okay, so the pictures are great and the sound is captivating. Awesome. Wow. But I want more. Zen Zen Eo. Ever wanted that 360 degree computer game effect? You got it. Introducing TrueView from Intel. Here, high resolution cameras are placed at up to 35 points in the arena, capturing high res volumetric video, measuring height, width, and depth in voxels. These are fed to processors which churn terabytes of data every minute to produce footage that provide matrix style revolves in space to see every angle. This is also in tandem with a multi-camera replay system used in certain events. This takes 60 to 80 4K cameras strategically positioned at key venues, from gymnastics, athletics, to BMX and skateboarding. Here, the camera's focus and zoom is controlled by one operator. And for the replay, the operator selects a point where the motion is frozen and can control replay from side to side and zoom in without losing resolution. Very matrixy. Motto. You know how every year viewers at home become armchair experts by watching the sport? Well, it seems I've also answered prayers for that too. 3D athlete tracking was implemented here, which uses computer vision and AI to extract the form and motion of athletes, transforming this data as overlays to give you detailed info, such as seen in these top speed of the sprinters right here. And doing away with a level of distancing by getting even closer to the athletes, biometric data display technology allowed us to get a closer feel to an athlete's state at a key moment in time. In archery, four cameras are placed 10 meters away from them, which analyzes slight skin color changes and blood vessel contractions to present their heartbeat and adrenaline rush moments before they fire their arrow. Very tense. True VR was also introduced at this year's games. After a successful debut in Pyeongchang 2018, where a viewer could slip on the headset and be in the games themselves, some pretty nifty cameras are installed at various venues. 
based on the impressive speeds and low latency of 5G to transmit race information in real time. OBS had presented over 110 hours of 180 degree stereoscopic and 360 degree panoramic coverage of the ceremonies and other events. NBC offered their brand of VR for viewers watching alone at home and this is a really nice touch this one. This technology was also brilliantly used for disabled children to watch the games across Tokyo. Now of all technology used, speaking of Intel, on top of handling the petabytes of visual content and being a technical backbone for the games, they decided to add a little sparkle. In the opening ceremony, we were treated to one of the most breathtaking moments of the games, an incredible light drone show. 1,824 Intel Shooting Star 3 drones, weighing 340 grams, took to the skies in an incredible display turning from dazzling shapes, to the official logo, to a spinning globe. Now these feature ultra bright LEDs perfect for entertainment and feature real time kinematic GPS which allows for perfect positioning for some ultra high resolution displays. This is also the same technology used in the 2018 Pyeongchang Games, the first seen at any Olympic Games and was also notable for operating in some sub-zero temperatures. Chilly. I actually quite like the sound as they take off, sounding like mini jets were coming together and would light up the sky. Very cute and very impressive. Projection mapping was back again this year, making an impressive appearance in the opening ceremonies. Panasonic, back again as global Olympic partners, wowed us all with an impressive setup of projection mapping on the floor of the arena, as they set up gorgeous effects, which I actually quite liked, as they danced and moved to this really catchy soundtrack and sound effects. Now this setup takes a range of impressive projectors from Panasonic, seen in Rio 2016, and again at Pyeongchang 2018, when it battled sub-zero temperatures for a seamless video floor. To ensure absolutely perfect images, these projectors are calibrated every single day as heat makes it expand and any movement of millimetres can mean centimetres on the ground, completely ruining any effects. It doesn't end there. For the grand introduction of, say, the Olympics Pièce de Résistance, the 100 metre finals were televised to this spectacular thing. The stadium was plunged into darkness to present this incredible light and projection show on the track, mixing entertainment values and projecting of the finalists as superstars. A track melts and warps and takes on a 3D trip through Tokyo and lands as it presents your finalists. <laughs> At this rate, all you probably needed was a to vote for your favourite, call 0901 112255 and add number one for Jeanelle, number two for Lamont, add three for... You get the picture. A bit of a challenge to reflect light bright enough on a track that's mostly red in colour, but an impressive display nonetheless, to drum up excitement and suspense for an event that ends in 10 seconds. All of this was a logistics labyrinth, but made to fit neatly into the very tight schedule. Athletes are briefed 8 minutes before their track call, with 4 minutes for final warm ups, and then it's lights out, showtime, set to fit in 3 minutes and 30 seconds before the start of the race, which is the usual track race introduction time. Oh, and plans ensure that officials and journalists nearby had lamps to make sure they weren't too shocked by the sudden darkness. This was first in that grand scale of the World Championships in Doha 2019 and is the brainchild of Florian Weber, World Athletics Event Presentation Manager, where, as the lights plunge the stadium into darkness, shots of Doha mixed with cinematic cuts of the athletes and horses set the stage with impressive AR for the event title as the icing on the cake. Tokyo officials came, saw, and wanted it. I think this is a fantastic setup from the elaborate introductions you've seen as athletes make their marks in previous games, something seen as far back as London 2012 when this was first introduced. Notable for being the year with a huge entertainment and music presence throughout the games to keep spectators excited. Of course you do see a standard introduction of the athletes during the games, possible as a smart way to further social distance the athletes and link again with music, it plays a huge part here in Tokyo 2020. Oh, you're right. Dramatic soundtrack played as they get into position. As sporting events of this scale progress, we're seeing a bit of a merging of entertainment values and high pressure events to really drum up tension and excitement for the viewer, as if there wasn't any already. And speaking of fantastic presentation moments, is this impressive showcase in the opening ceremony of the pictograms becoming human? Ikumaini, here are some of my Fliss faves. If you ask me, all the camera operators deserve medal at these games, including this very unfortunate incident of the camera operator getting walloped by the Australian skateboarder. Talk about getting into the action. This dude is probably the easiest maneuver of the games. Maybe the most boring? 
There's a technique to it, I'm sure. There's a technique. Speaking of boring, this will probably call all the action. A cockroach at the Spoon and Argentina hockey match. And Pictogram Sand delivering some smooth camera moves in between human pictogramming. Other faves include projection mapping taken to the max with this before probably the most spoken about events of the Olympic Games, the 100 meter finals, which I think is absolutely incredible. See more of this in future games, I'm sure. Also how countries adapted and presented their games even though they weren't in Tokyo. Shoutouts go to the BBC for their incredible setup of what looks to be a Tokyo skyline with their changing set. And of course the graphics, of which, fun fact, OBS generates over 110,000 elements customised for every game. The flat, crisp design and how it's just, just crisp and clear and just, ugh, love it. Kyo wa koride owari desu. That's it lads, that's been a little gold rule dive into how the games of the 32nd Olympiad was brought from the land of the sunrises to wherever you were. In a land and age of immense cutting edge technology and with a pandemic to contend with, OBS's goals to make this the most immersive and the most covered games ever were lofty but helped deliver an absolutely impressive and unforgettable Olympiad. What were your favourite parts of the games as a whole? Did you love the Olympic ceremony? Did you like when the cameras were going round and round in circles capturing everything? Or what parts did you not quite like? What got your gold, silver and bronze? Let me know in the comments section below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel for even more live show creativeness and follow me on my social channels right here. Plus, there's even more previous videos right here for you to enjoy. So, till next time people, always remember to hit record and stay alive. Peace.